science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and a science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. Put on your lab coat, put on your safety glasses, and hold on to your tail. This is the Science Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Science Podcast. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. It's week three with a cat in the house. And if you listened to last week's podcast, we broke down how I'm not allergic to ginger. It's a scientific miracle, maybe? I didn't know I'd be able to get this close to a cat for so long and have no allergic reaction. So go science! All of Bunsen snow is melting. Poor guy, it's getting warmer. I don't know if we're going to have spring or we'll just plow right through into summer in a month. I'm not sure, but honestly, and off again snow has given Bunsen occasional superpowers and uh, Beaker is enjoying digging for prey. So I think that's what rounds out everything for us. Uh, this podcast will come out on the day that we're heading up to the Calgary Comic Con. So from a family perspective, we're really excited about that to go to something that we really enjoy doing as a family and that's getting our nerd on with other nerds. <laughs> All right, what's on the science podcast this week? In science news, we're going to look at a new study that found that cities on the coast are sinking faster than they thought. Uh-oh. In pet science, we're going to look at an interesting study that found children view eating animals much differently than adults. In Ask an Expert, we have an amazing guest, uh, Jennifer Hartman, who's with Rogue Detection Dogs. You're going to want to listen to this. It is fascinating. Hey, dog, speaking of sinking, did you know that historians have proved that every single zodiac sign survived the sinking of the Titanic? Well, all except for Leo. <laughs> That's a good one. All right, I'm with the show because there's no time like science time. All right, this week in science news, I saw this article about sinking cities. And it reminded me of one, of one of Canada's most famous bands, The Tragically Hip, because they have a song that goes, New Orleans is sinking and I don't want to swim. I'm a terrible singer, but Chris sings that line all the time. And I saw this, I was like, oh my goodness, coastal cities are sinking. New Orleans is coastal city. Uh, let's, let's figure out what's going on here, right? Well, this study comes from the University of Rhode Island, uh, Matt Wee is an earth scientist and studied 99 coastal cities on six different continents. I don't know why Matt didn't get to 100, but I guess he got a Wayne Gretzky amount of cities. Anyway, so they wanted to balance how populous the city was with where it was. They wanted to balance all of that. And they looked at how much the city was sinking based on a whole bunch of new data. So what did they rely on? How do you tell if a city is sinking? Do you uh, uh, do you take a picture of it and see how much further down it is? Like, I don't know. Like we have, um, you sometimes put a trailer out in the field and over the course of it sitting there, it settles and it sinks and you're like, it clearly sinking, but I don't know how you can tell if a city's sinking. Well, they figured this out by using European satellites. Now these satellites beam microwave signals down to earth and then rec record the waves that come back to the satellite. So beam it down and then it comes back. If the city sinks a little bit, it takes a tiny, tiny bit longer for the wave to get back, right? Because it's a little bit further away. And the team determined within a millimeter of accuracy. So I guess this is really accurate. They obviously would have had to calibrate it on something that was sinking on Earth to prove that it was working that way, right? So these satellites... Gave, gave them really good data. Uh, it went around the same place every 12 days or so. So they could trace over the course of many years, this pinging back and forth. Now, the bad news is that five center, the bad news is some cities are sinking five centimeters a year. And those are the big Asian cities like uh, Tijan, um, Karchi, and in and Manila in the Philippines. Most of the places that they looked at, the average of the city isn't as high as five centimeters. It's closer to one. Five centimeters is nothing to sneeze about. It's just shy of two inches. Okay, so like five, five centimeters is noticeable. 
That's a lot. One centimeter in places, 10 millimeters, is also noticeable. So what's causing these cities to sink? Well, people. That's the conclusion. The cities that sunk the fastest or the areas that sunk the fastest were the most dense with people. Also, cities that use the groundwater sunk faster. By pumping out water stored within the aquifers, which took up space and propped up the land above it, as that water left, there was more settling of the city. This is not new news. Cities have been sinking for a while on the coast, and some cities have actually taken to heart that they should do different things. And other cities like Shanghai were, were sinking, I guess, up to 10 centimeters a year. That's, that's significant. And that's down significantly, probably due to different regulations about pumping out groundwater and how buildings are built. Now, why is this all interesting? Why is this important? Well, I thought it was cool that they're using satellites to figure out that cities are sinking with these microwave um, beams, beam it down, it beams back. I guess like humans get smaller as we age, right? So I guess if you were to stand out in a field every day, the satellite might say you're shrinking, but maybe you're standing in the same place in the ground under you shrinking. I don't know about that. At any rate, it's bad news if the coastal cities are sinking. At the same time, the oceans are rising. Now, the oceans are very slowly rising, and if the cities are very slowly sinking, you kind of reach a point where nobody's going to be able to live there in the future. Now, this is not tomorrow, but it's not like 200 years from now. All of this is good data in the climate change debate. And when I say debate, not that it isn't or is happening. It's happening just like what to do about it. Um, if cities are sinking, they need to invest in infrastructure to keep the water at bay in 10 years when 10 times one is or 10 times five, you, you go down half a meter, which is ridiculous. <laughs> um, so in, in the future, this data can probably help influence policy with what to do with cities as they sink into the ground. New Orleans is sinking and I don't want to swim. That's science news for this week. This week in Pet Science, we have a really interesting article that might prove a bit controversial, and it's about eating animals. So before we get into it, let's just keep everything on the level. I eat meat. I'm a meat eater. Uh, I eat animal protein. We don't eat a lot, but it's not something that I avoid. Um, Chris is a vegetarian. She does not eat any meat at all. And then we left the choice to eat or not eat meat to our boys. And they both eat meat, though I would say not as much as the average person, kind of like me. Not like we have big steak dinners or anything like that. Um, I can't actually remember the last time I had a steak. So I saw this study and it, it does hit home because our family is, I don't know if you want to use the word blended that way, where Chris is a vegetarian. Um, so we have to prepare a meal that has no animal protein in it for her. And I, but the boys and I would eat protein. So it was always kind of like uh, a bit of a, a tightrope to walk when we were cooking. This study comes from the University of Exeter and it looks at kids between the ages of nine and 11 and how they feel about eating animals, kind of the moral status, um, and then compares it to adults. And there were some really surprising findings. I don't know if it's too surprising if you've had kids, um, but it goes a little bit like this. The lead author is Dr. Luke McGure. Um, and one of the conclusions was, is that humans relationships with all of the different animals on the earth is, is kind of complicated. If you think of it, and this is kind of paraphrasing what the, what the doctor said. If you kind of think of it, we have cats and dogs, um, that are pets. We love them. I love them. And the odd family has other animals like rabbits or gerbils or birds, or some people have horses, but there's some animals we've decided to eat in North America and we don't see them as pets. At least I don't. And that's weird. And that's what caught my eye with this study. So they surveyed just about 500 people living in England from three age groups, young, nine to 11, young adults, 18 to 21, and then young adults to middle age, 29 to 59. And what they found was the two older groups had very similar views on what they felt the ethical standards were with eating animals. So there seems to be something that happens because that younger group had way more objections to eating animals. They were more likely to, when they found out that animals like pigs or cows were eaten, would have some problems with it. They wanted those animals to be treated like pets. 
But something happens at an adolescent that switches that. And that's what this this study was looking at. There's something called speciesism, where the relationship with animals becomes more complicated and there's some double standards that start to apply, where you put one animal in one box and another animal in another. Now, something that doesn't disappear entirely, which I thought was interesting, is that the adults in both like the young adults and the older adults had less objections to eating animal byproducts that wasn't necessarily ending the life of the animal, like milk or eggs or cheese. If you had kids growing up, you may have had to have a difficult conversation with some of them that the meat that, especially if your family is a meat-eating family, that the meat that they eat comes from an animal on a farm and that that animal has to die. And that's a tough conversation. We grew up on a farm and we're in rural Alberta, so we're surrounded by farm animals all the time, cows and Some families have pigs and chickens. Yeah, we've had chickens for a while. So our kids were kind of exposed to the the life cycle of animals on a farm. And I know the the industrial complex of producing protein for humans is very complicated. And there are some bad actors that give farmers a really bad name. I do want to just give a shout out to the farmers that we live around, because we do live around farmers that raise cattle and raise pigs. Um, they treat the animals with the utmost respect and they give their life for protein. So it is, it is tough to wrap your head around. Like I go, it's so weird, isn't it? I don't know. I didn't mean to get really philosophical, but I saw this study and it was really interesting to see that something from a child to a, an adult switches off or changes. Cause I think that way I can pet a cow and really like the cow and, and then not have a problem with eating ground beef and a taco. Part of me is changing though, from being around animals so much. I, I maybe think I should eat less meat because of that. I don't know. What do you think? If you see a tweet about this specific concept, let's have a discussion on Twitter. All right. That's pet science for this week. Hey everybody, before we get to the interview section, I thought I would just give you some ideas about how you could support the Science Podcast. Number one, you could support us on Patreon. Check out patreon.com backslash Bunsen Burner. There's multiple tiers of support, and the lowest tier of support is not much more than a cup of coffee a month. The second way is you could check out our merch shop. We've worked really hard to partner with clothing companies that do a great job of providing vibrant colors and soft feels. We also have the Beaker Stuffy for sale. It's so cute. The third way you could support us is giving us great reviews on our podcast playing apps. Any kind of review helps. And if you can't find a review, share our podcast with people. Thanks, everybody. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast, and I have Jennifer Hartman with me today, who's a field scientist with some... Well, some exciting stuff that's right up the podcast alley. How are you doing today, Jennifer? I'm doing great. Thank you. Hi. Where Where are you calling into the podcast from in the world? I'm based, uh, well, we're based in Washington State, although I'm a Colorado native. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here in eastern Washington. It's very snowy. <laughs> Happy to be on the podcast. You're in Washington State. Um, you're from, are you from Colorado originally? Like, is that where your home base is grew, growing up? Correct. Yeah, I grew up. Um, mostly in Colorado and then a little bit in Connecticut and then somehow found my way to Washington. <laughs> now, one of the things right off the bat that you, you're, you're involved with is um, this organization. Uh, hopefully I, I pronounce it correctly. It's called Rogue Dogs. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, our official title is Rogue Detection Teams. Um, but yeah, a lot of folks just shorten us to rogue dogs. It's a lot easier to say. <laughs> <laughs> rogue Detection Teams. What makes it so exciting is... This organization does amazing things with training animals, dogs, to help conservation efforts with animals. I don't want to give away too much because I'm going to let you explain it. So that's kind of the preamble. So in your own words, Jennifer, what's rogue dogs? What are they all about? (laughs) Yeah, Um, kind of a odd name, I know, um, we could have called ourselves, you know, conservation dogs or eco dogs. Um, but we kind of went a little bit uh, different because one, um, the dogs we work with, our conservation detection dogs, are all the misfits and the rapscallions of the shelter world. They're typically the ones you'll, you know, that don't get adopted <laughs> because of their extreme um, obsession and drive to play fetch. Um, so they're a little bit of the of the rogues in the shelter world, okay. and um, 
also our detection dog handlers, myself and others included in our, in our program, we kind of uh, we kind of feel like we're the rogues of the biology world too, because this method is um, a non-invasive wildlife uh, method, and we're able to locate data on wildlife without ever having to see them or collar them. So it's very non-traditional, kind of still on the edges and periphery of scientific hmm. methodologies um, that are used to wildlife. So we're the rogues ourselves. Um, and we also wanted to highlight detection teams. Like we, we work with a human. Um, so it's a dog plus us out there to do this work. So the emphasis, even though our dogs are way cooler than us, um, it's not just about them. So we wanted to share with the world that uh, the way this methodology works um, to find this cryptic data is by working alongside um, a human and a dog. That's kind of like the 10,000 foot picture, right? So what do the rogue <laughs> dogs do? What do these dogs do? Yeah. So very good question because uh, <laughs> this will either gross people out or people will get really excited about this. Um, our detection dogs, like I was saying, um, locate data. And this data that I'm talking about can be anything from you know, viruses in plants that are affecting them. It can be toxins in the environment like PCBs and paint. Um, but it can also be uh, wildlife, uh, specifically scat, also known as feces or poop. <laughs> and inside scat is actually an yeah. amazing uh, array of information, kind of like going to the doctor to have a blood sample taken. And you can learn, you know, give us a whole spreadsheet of what's going on internally. Um, so that's what we can get from wildlife scat. So we go on projects surveying for really um, often threatened or endangered species like wolves or caterpillars or, um, oh gosh, just everything, mountain lions, Sierra Nevada red fox, we've tigers and pangolins. So the list is ongoing and still growing. <laughs> so there's this big umbrella of things that they can detect. Is it equally dispersed? Like some days you're looking for types of paint another day you're looking for a wolf or is it more skewed towards the animals that they're detecting? Oh, I see. Yes. Good question. So we, we go on very specific projects geared for that particular target or species. So say if I was going to go on a wolf project um, and the, you know, the funding was for a month, I would be spending a month out in the wilds um, surveying uh, for wolves across a specific landscape. And then if we were contracted um, mm. to search for, you know, diseases or these toxins, it would be very specific to that, um, that area. So it's project by project. And, but our, we gotcha. have seven folks in our um, program right now and 14 dogs. So we can go on a diversity of projects throughout the year. Um, like last year, gosh, I lost count, but maybe 10 or 15 projects <laughs> um, I, I went on throughout the year. Wow, that's that's amazing. So it's project by project, and but you're, the organization has a bunch of different projects going at once. Thus lies your diversity. I love it. That's so interesting. I was going to say that's what is so fascinating about this field is just um, going from different species and then, you know, kind of de developing these proof of concept projects to find uh you know, data on different species. So I'm constantly learning and about different ecosystems and about different wildlife. And that's, I just love that part of, the, of, of, our, of our work. So one of the things that our listeners are going to be really curious about is how do you train the dogs to detect all of these other, these things, right? Um, going into this interview, I thought it was mostly animals, but it's not. So how... Could you walk us through the steps of how the animals are trained to detect all, like maybe a couple different things in the projects? Sure. Um, it's actually the same for, for all of our projects. Um, that is the million dollar question everyone asks us. And surprisingly, it's, it's probably the simplest part of, of our work because the dogs that we specially select for this are so highly driven to play fetch. And that's how we reward them in the wilds, in the woods, or wherever we might be um, for successfully locating data for us. And they will continue to search all day for that um, one or two opportunities to play ball. And hopefully more, <laughs> depending on the amount of 
data we find, of course, but <laughs> it's very simple. Uh, we get the, the source odor. So say this is from a wolf. We um, try to get wild samples from the region we'll be surveying in in case there are different diets or um, just regional differences in the species. And um, we call it zoodoo. We prefer not to have zoodoo. <laughs> Uh, scats um, sourced from zoos because their <laughs> diet can be so dissimilar to wild animals. And what we're asking our dogs to find is typically that wild sample. So we don't want to confuse them with, well, here's this mm -hmm. odor from a zoo that might be very different than what you're going to encounter in oh. the wild. Um, but if we can't find zoo do, or I mean, if we can't find um, or, you know, get uh, samples from the wild of our target species because they are so few and so rare. Oftentimes, zoos are our only place to go um, to find, uh, you know, samples that are, at least will get us to the species. So once we have this sample, uh, we, we literally, we place it on the ground and um, our dog, you know, all dogs have this instinct to sniff. Um, some are more interested than others, but as soon as they go over to the sample and just smell it, uh, we throw the ball right in front of their nose. We're not asking them at this stage any commands, like any any alerts to give us. We just want to associate in their brains um, that odor equals ball. And then they get so jazzed, like, oh my gosh, I smelled this thing and the ball <laughs> disappeared out of nowhere. Oh. And they love that. And so then we build on that. <laughs> and from there, yeah, that's when we start to ask them to, okay. now we want them to sit. And now we want to, them to sit and stay. And um, so we just, we kind of, make it progressively more complicated but that initial introduction is literally 30 seconds and bam they're like woohoo best thing ever <laughs> and not every dog could it wouldn't work this way with a dog that does not like a ball isn't super obsessed with that as you mentioned like um these dogs are super super into that not yeah not only are they so driven to play fetch like that's the one thing they want to do in life um they also tend to have just a ton of energy. And so, yeah, not every dog would be suitable to become a conservation protection dog because we we head out into the wilds um, and we're, you know, living out of our cars or backpacking or camping for six to nine months of a year. And if you have a dog that, you know, likes to go to the dog park, sniff around, but then really likes, you know, his couch time or his hangout with his people time, um, <laughs> those aren't these dogs. <laughs> They love to to roam and wander um, no. and they just want to get out there and they have a lot of energy um, that they need to, to burn off. And we're happy to give them that outlet. It sounds like you as par somebody part like a field scientist, you also need to have a ton of energy. You can't be a couch yeah. potato yourself. <laughs> Surprisingly, uh, I love to curl up with a book uh, and just read all day. And I think I could do that for a living if someone wanted to pay me. <laughs> but um, yes, I do have a bit of wanderlust too. <laughs> okay. That, uh, one of the first things that drew me to this job was all the um, potential for travel and, and exploration and, and discovery and learning. Um, but yeah, so the, the folks that we hire too, um, you hit on a good point. They are kind of special too. Not everyone, even though everyone loves dogs, uh, not everyone um, necessarily makes a great conservation detection dog handler. So just as we select our dogs very carefully um, from, from shelters and it's like one in a in hundred or one in every two to 300, um, it's also very challenging to find uh, suitable conservation detection dog handlers. So, What have some of the successes been of this initiative? Oh, yeah. Um, let's see. I, I've been on a number of projects, and as you likely know, um, you know, being in the science field, a lot depends on what gets published. <laughs> And, uh, and that sometimes defines mm -hmm. the successes. So a lot of our work never makes it to the publishing stage just because sometimes it's, that's not the, the um, overall aim of, of the goal. I mean, so the goal of the project. Um, but in other cases, um, it is. So those, those have been some exciting projects we've been on with um, Humboldt Martin. It's an endangered uh, subspecies of Martin in the United States, a coastal uh, Martin, and we're helping to kind of 
expand the knowledge on where their range is uh, because there's such a little data on, on the subspecies um, that our dogs are able to expand that scat by scat. Like they're here, but they're not here. And they're here, but they're not here. And a really exciting discovery um, hmm. last year, uh, one of our dogs found larva of an endangered butterfly in the wild that hasn't been seen um, in over 40 years or found in over 40 years. So to backtrack Whoa. on that, we know we do see the butterflies. Um, researchers have seen the butterflies, but there's this captive breeding program where they're releasing the adults. And then they do this census, you know, every year, like, okay, we see adults, but no one knew if their captive breeding program was actually encouraging, you know, the wild population to mate with this captive breeding program and, and grow ultimately mm. that population. So they needed to understand whether or not this captive breeding program was working. And the only way to do that is to find larvae um, in the wild. So our dogs uh, went out <laughs> uh, into um, these meadows and were able to find these areas where the caterpillars, and if you think about um, the tip of a pen or grain of rice, um, that's how tiny these caterpillar are. And they at first were alerting us to places where uh, they were feeding and they only feed on this particular violet and they feed in a very specific way. So we knew that we were finding, for example, the frass, which is caterpillar poo, um, but we could never find the larva um, because, well, we didn't have permits, but also, um, you know, they're just so tiny. So we finally got the permit to be able to search for them last year. And we were we were all blown away from us to the researchers. I mean, even though we work in this field, um, you know, the past 20 years, we're still amazed by what our dogs show us. And Pips, one of our dogs, just started pinpointing larva after larva after larva. And it, we were all just we all wow. just looked at each other stunned. Um, yeah, it was a really magical moment. <laughs> And this is like, there's no way, there's nothing humans can do except like look at every blade of whatever under a microscope to find these things. Yeah. Um, what they have been doing, like I said, was going out and looking for the adults. But caterpillars, um, at least this species, spend mm -hmm. about 80% of their life stage is in the larva form. And yeah, they just weren't having any luck finding that. And that's typically... That's who reaches out to us is we've tried everything. We're, this is our last ditch effort. We, we need to help this endangered species. Can your dogs find so-and-so? And, and that's typically what launches our <laughs> projects is, you know, <laughs> can they save the day? <laughs> that's, uh, you know, that's so uh, on brand though, isn't it, right? The dogs are rogues. You guys are rogues. And the scientists themselves have to go rogue because what they've been doing isn't working. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's it's kind of this, um, it's just a fun um, and to me fascinating way of working on a, on a project because I think for a lot of people, they still haven't considered working with detection dogs on their projects. So typically, and it, it's the same way we find our dogs. It's those people who or the shelters who are like, we don't know, we have no more outlets for this dog. We have tried, they have been in foster homes, they've been bounced around and, you know, we're just at our wit's end. And, and some of our dogs have even come from euthanasia lists because there's, there's just no hope for them. And those are the dogs mm -hmm. that we love. And even though the projects that we go on are super challenging, like this caterpillar one, um, we love learning whether or not um, our dogs can help us find data. on these. That's things. just uh that's very touching and cool. I love it. I, I want to, I, I would hope, I'm kind of stuttering here, but I'm just, I'm getting to the point. I would hope that more scientists understand just how powerful dog detecting, detection science is. I mean, there's dogs that can detect COVID, right? Like that was all over the news about eight months ago. Um, yeah. There's dogs that can detect when somebody's going to have a seizure or if their blood sugar's low, if they're stressed or having a panic attack. So um, the evidence is there that dogs can smell things that is impossible for us to wrap our head around. I think it's just the, I don't know what it is. Is that an improvement that you were hoping that would come to your, your project is that more people would just know about your, your team? Yeah. Um, yes and no. I, 
it's interesting because I think we, I, it's like you said, I think there's this general knowledge and belief that dogs have incredible sense of smell and help on so many things from, um, you know, if a human has low bread, blood pressure or um, is about to have a seizure or can detect bombs. Um, and those are fields that I think are generally mm -hmm. respected or more known about. Um, and the conservation detection dog world tends to be on the periphery and um, not as well, I think, known about. And then also when you get into it, maybe not as well respected because it's like, oh, dog sniffing poop. Yeah, my dog does that every day. I mean, we get that uh, comment a lot. <laughs> and then I also, like I was sharing with the detection teams, I don't think they're at least like I would never think I could be a bomb detection dog handler, but there seems to be this idea like, oh, I love dogs um, and I love the outdoors. Hence, this would make a great fit for me. I'll do this um, without the realization that maybe not every um, person uh, can go out into the field and do what we do. So it, I think sometimes it floods the field with well-meaning um, intentions. And then, like I said, with published papers, what happens sometimes is that if there's, if someone goes out and says, well, I have a pet dog, you know, hire us, we're local, and they go out and they maybe don't find a lot of data or that where the dog eats the data or the dog pees on the data or the dog runs off or chases wildlife, it kind of gives um, the field um, less kind of respectability. I, I hate to say that, but it's almost like, oh, it doesn't work. So then if, if that goes into publication, then it does it lends less credibility to the overall methodology. So yeah, one of our goals and hopes with mm -hmm. those tech teams, and I think in this world in general with the profession, um, the professional conservation detection dog groups operating around the world, is to highlight that no detection teams do work, and this these are this is how we work, and this is how um, we were you know set apart from just someone who likes to hike with their dog in nature. Um, so. That's part of what we're hoping to be involved mm -hmm. with, you know, with the with the research that we do with with different wildlife. You know, it sounds like the similar conversations I've had with folks who have a service dog or an emotional support animal versus people that just want to have their dog with them in a restaurant, right? It can give a bad name to service dogs when they're you know, there's like considerable training and rules that go into getting yourself a service animal. You could just say, yeah. yeah, my dog's great at um, finding, you know, wolf poop. And then they're, they're, <laughs> they just create a chaos for the research team. Yeah. And I, I think um, because we have spoken with different scientists and researchers, we're like, we heard about this years ago and we tried it and it didn't work. So nothing now is going to make us want to invest that money in this again. Because, you know, also in the conservation world, there isn't a ton of funding. Um, and like I said, it's often the last ditch effort mm -hmm. um, to save a species and they've already spent um, possibly whatever funding or grant money they could, you know, scrounge up. So they also, it's a risk, right? They, they have to weigh that risk analysis and should we yeah. go with detection dog teams at this stage or should we continue with the traditional methods that, you know, aren't working here, but have been tried and true elsewhere. And so we're trying to, um, us and many other detection dog programs um, through the work that we do, um, get it to the stage where maybe we're not on the periphery and we're, we're part of that uh, traditional mix of these are the methodologies that we use and deploy to locate data on, on wildlife or, or other, you know, odors. Um, but it's, it's a big kind of uphill um battle. I'd say we, you know, I've been in this field for 15 years and um, I'm still not seeing a lot of uh, confidence yet. It's growing, um, but it's definitely slow. So <laughs> um, mm -hmm. time will tell. Yeah. I've read the data on so many different – from the podcast for the last three years, right? Like we – I've looked at data on dogs and, and studies on dogs, and and it's it's conclusive that there are things dogs can do that are almost – magical to humans and literally are better than any technology that we can ever invent. Um, exactly. So and I, I think hope you, that the, you, you, you get off the peripheral. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, no, I, I, I love that you use the word technology because I, I think if we can think about 
I mean, we don't like to say that our jobs are, are tools per se. Obviously, there are our colleagues and our, um, we're out there as, as equals out there, but they are a technology. And um, just like with any technology, it mm-hmm. needs to be developed. And so we'd love to see, see this technology developed more and utilized um, around the world more because there's, there's so much more that um, detection dogs could be helping with. So we're excited to see where that goes. Oh, what is your, <clears throat> you're an American. What's the, what's the research division of the army? Um, uh, D- DARPA, oh. DARPA, is that right? I think it was something DARPA did. Anyways, it's an arm of the American army. They spent millions and millions of dollars trying to d- d- make a technology to sniff out bombs like a dog's nose would. And after like four or five years and millions upon millions of dollars pumped into this project, it got beat by a dog the first day soundly. And they're just like, <laughs> this is stupid. And they gave up. On oh, this. wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, and you know, um, yeah. in Cambodia, there is a group called Hero Rats and they train rats to sniff for bombs um, because they're very lightweight and they can set up a kind oh, of a yeah. safe uh, working parameters for them. So you're not sending, you know, human or a dog into possibly unsafe situations. Um, and so I, I think that animals have oh. so much capacity to help us um, and us, them, hopefully, as, as we change our minds about, you know, what they are, what their status is. Um, so I, I love stories like that because we see it every day. Um, and then what's really exciting is when we bring on new people and they kind of think they know what to expect. You know, they've read articles or they, they just have an <laughs> affinity for dogs. But when they first see the dogs do what they do without fail, their minds are just like blown. They're like, whoa, I had no idea like just how joyful they are, how obsessed they are, how driven they are to find this. Like this was what they were meant to do. And um, that's, pro- that's probably one of the most tangible parts about our job is getting to see well, not only adopting the dogs, but then seeing seeing how they change people's um, perception about about dogs. You know, they probably have some ancient DNA from some wolf twenty thousand years ago that was like the super annoying, you know, <laughs> obsessive wolf of the wolf pack that just wouldn't leave anybody alone. You know, they're like Harvey, just just relax and. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the DNA totally. that survived down through these dogs after 20,000 years. Yeah. Speaking of wolves, there was this study, um, I think, where, well, they had wolves on camera and then there was some trash around, you know, just plastic bottles. And they caught these um, certain wolf puppies playing with the, the plastic bottles, like playing fetch and, and tug, whereas other wolf puppies in that same pack or other wolves in the pack had no interest. And so, and I, I don't remember the title of it, we could probably look it up, um, but I just remember thinking that's just so fascinating that there was this gene possibly for a fetch obsession <laughs> way back when, um, and here we are <laughs> well down the line with yeah. these certain dogs that have been selected for that, you know, through through their genes. So um, it's just so fascinating. Yeah, we have so much to learn. Um, my eyes are constantly being open. The history of dogs and, you know, the selection of, what, you know, the dogs that we have today, it's its fascinating. It's mind-blowing. So a couple standard questions we ask on the podcast is for a pet story. Now, the irony is, is we've been talking about dogs this whole time. Um, but Jennifer, do you have a pet story you could share with us from your life? Yeah, actually, um, funnily enough, you know, growing up, my family was one of the families I was, you know, I was, I loved animals and I wanted a pet of every single kind, whether it was a snake or a, or a cat or a dog. And my family kept saying, no, no, no. Uh, finally, um, one day when I was 12 years old, um, I got a, a kitten and I promptly became very, very obsessed with her. She was my everything. Um, and I remember being in class one day uh, in high school a few years later, and we were learning about taxes and how to file them and, um, you know, you have to write down your assets, right? And I was like, and I, I, I raised my hand, like, what's an asset? And they're like, well, the thing that is most valuable to you, the thing that is, that has the most value. And so on my tax return, <laughs> I wrote, you know, my cat. And <laughs> of course, I didn't, I didn't pass that because, <laughs> um, 
you know, that's not what uh, your tax returns are supposed to um, list. But to me, that that was the most important uh, being in, in my life was was this cat. And so when people learn that I work with dogs, they're like, oh, you know, you must just love dogs. And I'm like, well, honestly, I'm a big cat person. And uh, I can't wait till the day I have a cat again <laughs> because my my job doesn't allow me to have many cats. You're always moving. Yeah. Many people share different pet stories on the podcast. And um, it's funny how people identify with different types of pets. Uh, you mentioned rats. We've had a scientist that loves rats. They have pet rats. They had pet rats when they were kids. Um, and then other scientists, they they connect with cats. Some connect with um, rabbits <laughs> and dogs. Yeah. So it, it doesn't matter. But uh I think it's cool how yeah I think it's cool how people connect with different pets. Animals have this incredible capacity to let them into their lives, and I think that's just what's so special about them. Whatever the species, um, because if you talk to amphibian lovers or reptile lovers too, they're like, oh, this individual this and this individual that, and and I, I think it's just so incredible, um, just how we're able to develop these relationships. So well said. Now, the million dollar question is, could you train a cat to detect stuff? Or are they <laughs> too meh about the idea? <laughs> that is a brilliant question. Um, no, to my knowledge, no one's tried that yet. We did meet a cat um, once who helped to train dogs um, because he was this like, kind of really fat cat who wasn't afraid of any dog. And <laughs> so they would place him out in trees and that's how they would teach their dogs to kind of do search and rescue on <laughs> missing cats. And we thought, well, this is brilliant. And his name was Cheeto the cat, but he had absolutely no desire to do anything other than just lounge. Um, my cat would kind of play fetch, but you know, that was, typically at night when I was trying to sleep and um, it, I could never just turn it on when I wanted to. And our dogs, it's very, you know, it's all the time, <laughs> whatever time of day or night. And so um, it would be interesting. I don't know how <laughs> efficient they'd be. <laughs> <laughs> so this Cheeto cat, they just like yeet it up in the tree and it would just stick around until the dogs found it. Yeah. It does. It wouldn't move. It would just hang out, and then as soon as the search was <laughs> over, it's like, "Cool, let's oh go home." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a cat! What a cat! <laughs> Sorry, I had to ask. I was just, you know, I was just curious. Um, <laughs> but thank you for sharing your pet story. The next question, um, the next standard question, is the super fact. It's something that you know that when you tell people, kind of blows their mind a bit. Uh, do you have a super fact you could share with us? Yes. And actually, because um, I love listening to your podcast, this is one of my favorite parts of your podcast. And uh, when I knew that I'd be speaking oh, with you, I was like, you. oh my gosh, what's my super fact going to be? Um, so I actually have two, uh, which I hope is okay. But one, the first one, um, we were recently in talks with some folks about doing a beaver um, surveys. And part of how we learn about whether or not dogs would be um, you know, effective tool at looking for different animals is to learn more about them and the different types of odors they might they might leave behind. And this researcher said that um, beavers have scent glands um, and will often leave them on these mounds to communicate with each other and that um, males and females smell differently. And so the only way to sex them, um, because they you know can't see their, you know, genitalia, <laughs> is to cut is to um, learn from the from this gland and so what we learned so it's by squeezing them too which is hilarious um what we learned is that females uh they smell like old cheese and males smell like motor oil <laughs> and as soon as i heard that i was like you, you've got to be kidding me this is awesome that i get to learn this stuff as um part of my job uh so that was a fun fact and then i thought what might be fun for your listeners is uh, I was on a pangolin uh, project in Nepal, and pangolin are one of the most illegally trafficked animals in the world, and we knew so, so little about them. So we were out there with our dogs um, trying to locate 
uh, scat or brown gold, as we call it. Um, and, you know, one time my dog started just scratching a little bit at the surface of the dirt. And I went over to look at where, where she was sniffing and the dirt was kind of glowing, like really shiny. And my heart skipped a beat and I realized like, oh my gosh, this has got to be pangolin scat because pangolins eat uh, a lot of ants and termites. So the carapace is shine. And as we uncovered this, um, you know, it just almost looked like dirt except for the shine. Uh, this terrible odor came up and we knew it was pangolin poop. But I don't think anyone knew at that stage that pangolins buried their scat. And so this was a really fun discovery that I made alongside uh, the detection dog that I was working at the time, Athena. And um, honestly, it's one of the, the biggest, most thrilling moments. I still get chills thinking about it. So that was my wow. other fun fact. <laughs> pangolins are just so amazing and 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 the story about them is so sad right um did you get to did you get to see any pangolins when you were in nepal or were you just kind of locating the scat and that was the end of the job oh good question yeah because typically we don't see the animals we we ever search for in nepal we never saw any of the pangolins that we were collecting data on but we did go to Vietnam um, and one of the areas we were serving, they had released a lot of pangolins from, um, you know, they, it's very sad, like you said, but um, there's this program out there, Save Vietnam's Wildlife, that will rehabilitate uh, pangolins that have been confiscated, you know, at the borders by, by the authorities. And so they have a rehabilitation center and then they release them into the wild. And so one of the places that we were initially doing our training was where they had re, um, released some of these pangolins. And one day, one of our dogs uh, alerted up a tree and there was this cavity and we looked inside and sure enough, there was a pangolin curled up in a ball, just, you know, sleeping away the day so it could come out at night and feed. And we're like, what? So <laughs> we did see one in the wild um, uh, in Vietnam, and that was that was pretty thrilling. Well, those are super facts, and my mind is blown. Um, I know around where we live, there are beaver, but I don't know if I'm going to go sniffing any ground to see if they're male or female beaver. I think <laughs> I'm just going to stay out of their way. <laughs> yeah, old cheese and motor oil aren't my, um, my cup of tea either. <laughs> I would pick motor oil over the cheese, to be honest with you. So Me too. that's what I would pick. <laughs> um, the last section of the podcast is a fun one. We get to learn a little bit more about our guest outside of what they do. Um, it's called the important to you section where guests talk about hobbies or causes. And um, your, your cause that you wanted to talk about is really kind of, really kind of mirrors what you're doing right now with your detection dogs. Uh, what, what would your cause be that you'd like to talk about? Yeah. Um, I love this section too. And I, I've just learned so much from the other speakers you've had on. Um, I, I think if I wasn't doing this, you know, out in the field searching for wildlife and data on wildlife, I would still somehow be driven, um, to share about wildlife. So part of, um, our mission with Rose and honestly what I would do personally <laughs> if there was a droves, um, would be to highlight different wildlife organizations around the world uh, looking for and trying to help um, these species, whether it's like, say, Vietnam's wildlife, like I mentioned, or all the different organizations out there that, you know, really survive through donations um, to get to do the important work that they do. So I think I would probably, you know, maybe when I retire one day from this, that's that's what I would do too, is be an advocate for these different organizations um, to help people learn about the biodiversity that we have in the world. Um, that's really important to me. Hmm. So if you were, uh, if you had your druthers and you weren't with the dogs, where would you be in the world or what would be your main thing you'd be looking at supporting? Ooh. Um, well, I, I, I worked in Africa. Or is that once. too hard of a question? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no. Um, I don't, I don't know if I'd have, I, I think what's so fascinating about the conservation field is that there are so many options that people can help either from their home or from afar. And if I could do it all over again, or, the, you know, I wasn't doing road detection teams. 
I think I would have wanted to um, kind of follow in, you know, Jane Goodall or Diane Levy's uh, footsteps in go to Africa, uh, research, you know, um, a, a specific species and try to raise awareness for that species through what, what I learned either about their habits or, you know, their family structure, um, their feeding habits. It's all these things that um, the more information that we share with people, and people realize that animals um, are intelligent and have, you know, formed strong family bonds um, and are just so important for, for our ecosystems, both for human health, but also obviously for their own. Um, I think that's what I would want to do. And I, I hope in some way that that's what our mm -hmm. work is contributing to the more that we're able to find um, data on wildlife to answer some of these questions. So that would be mm -hmm. kind of my dream job. <laughs> Well, you know, thank you so much for talking about your um, love of conservation. Uh, you know, when I'm sitting in my house and it's like winter and I look outside and nothing is moving because it's like minus 40, I forget that there's, you know, around me, even in the snow, there's life teeming everywhere. So it's always a good reminder that everywhere in the world, all of our, the natural beauty of the earth uh, is something that we all need to be thinking about to help protect. Um, so, you know, this is, this is, that was a great conversation at the end there. That was a great statement you made at the end there. Thank you. Yeah. And you so perfectly put that too. Um, thanks for letting me share that. Well, you know, we're at the end of our chat, Jennifer. Um, I, I'm going to be reflecting on our conversation for weeks, just thinking about these amazing dogs and the work that they're doing. Um, I'm so glad that you you're on the podcast to talk about the work and maybe, you know, uh, with this platform increase the you know the eyeballs on the detection dogs is there a website or is there something that people can click on to get more information or a social media account oh yes thank you um yeah we have a website so we're at rogue dogs.org and um because i love sharing about this method in this field we try to diversify our social media footprint. So we're on Facebook and Instagram at Rogue Detection Teams. And how I first learned about you was on Twitter. So we're also on Twitter at um, Rogue Detection. And we're hoping to grow our YouTube channel too, where we okay. share kind of just fun scenes from the field and us out there searching. So you can find us on all those different platforms. If you're Again, thank you for taking the time to talk to me on the podcast about these amazing dogs. Uh, it's my extreme delight. And I, yeah, like I said, when I first learned about you, I was like, what? This is totally our jam. So I, I was really excited when you uh, were going <laughs> to, to have us on. So really the thanks goes to you. <laughs> okay, it's time for story time with me, Adam. If you don't know what story time is, oh, okay, Bunsen. You want, oh, you want you got anything else to say? Apparently Bunsen has nothing else to say. Well, if you don't know what story time is, story time is when we talk about stories that have, that have happened within the past of one or two weeks. Dad, do you have a story? Wow, I get to start. Okay, so I really love Adam's cat. Ginger is super cute. I l She's just a neat part of the day with the dogs. It's not that I don't love the dogs any less. It's just there's a new creature in the house that's kind of cool. Um, so <laughs> uh, we, I bought Ginger a harness, and I just straight up put it on her without any practice, and she didn't care. I got it around her neck. I got it around her belly. And she's like, well, I guess I'm wearing it. Um, and with the harness, we've been able to take her outside. So we took her on a, a hike and it snowed a ton, much to Chris's dismay. But I took Ginger outside and got some really good pictures of her in the snow. Um, I don't think she's a fan of the snow, though. I don't know if she's ever experienced snow before. <laughs> I think she's only been ever an inside cat and uh, the, the snow was a bit much and it was a bit deep. So she got to some less deep snow and then she was a little bit happier, but she was very happy to just come back inside the house and sit atop Beaker's crate on her queenly pillowcase or pillow that Chris has set up there that she surveys the house upon. So that's my story. Bonding time with Ginger. Yeah. Ginger's really curious about the outside. She's always been sort of curious about the outside. And like every time you open the door, you got to be careful because she might spring out. Um, you know what? I will do the next story. Um, my story happened today, actually. Uh, it was around the middle of the day. 
and mom was receiving a very important phone call. <laughs> this phone call already got off to a rough start because mom was sitting there and we were talking about the banjo. And then I was like, if you like the banjo, if you get no respect, you might as well be a redneck. Like, cause like that happened on the office and mom found it kind of funny, but the lady on the phone may or may not have heard that cause she didn't say hello. Um, Oh, what? Then a UPS guy comes and the dogs lose their mind every time a UPS guy or delivery dude comes. So they're barking they're they are barking so loudly. Ed the Bunsen is so loud and Beaker are Beaker's not as loud, but still fairly loud with her barking. But they were barking nonstop about this UPS guy. Um and he delivered uh these fun treats from someone. What's the name? Donna Craig. Donna Craig gave us some nice treats. Um, some fudge. I am so sick. Is- I ate seven or eight pieces of this like variety fudge. Uh, oh, it's so good, but I'm so sick. So Adam, watch yourself. It's so good. It's so good. I've had like five pieces and I, I, <laughs> I'm feeling a little sick myself. <laughs> um, but yeah, the UPS guy comes and they lose their mind, but it's all in, it's all good because we received some good treats and there was other stuff that went wrong with the phone call too, so it wasn't just us. Um, but yeah, that's my story. Mom, do you have a story? Chris, do you think Adam knows where the "you might be a redneck" actually comes from, and it's not the office? It's from Jeff Foxworthy. Well, no, but yeah, like, but I don't know if Adam has heard Jeff Foxworthy. Though. I do know that it's from Jeff Jeff Foxworthy. Okay, Adam knows, knows that. Okay, he says he says he knows. Know. Okay, he he says he knows. Um, but yeah, so the phone call was eventually successful. I just wanted to be professional on the phone call and it's, (laughs) it started with, hello, I'm so sorry. Did you hear my son's comedy session? Because we're not pranking you. Oh, cause I was calling her. It was just, it was just a comedy of errors but because my you have story to set up has this to... pizza for this marching band show. Yeah, and um I really want it to be successful and I want to honor their organization. Um but I just the phone call I just wanted to be so professional and Bunsen was barking and then she misunderstood because I said I wanted to use her organization but then she thought maybe I said I wasn't going to and I'm so glad we cleared that up. Ooh. It was, My favorite it was, was when you was, got uh, the taco food trucks all mixed up. There's Taco Monster, and then you were calling them Taco Munchers, and then you were calling yeah. them Taco Bandit. Like, well, which one is it? <laughs> would the real, real taco stand please stand up? Okay. Anyway. Uh, no. So my story actually has to do with something that happened last week. I'm not sure if you're aware, but Jason and I have been run off our feet, even though we're on holidays this week, but last week it was just very, very busy. So I was running Adam to town. I was uh, having to go pick up things and do stuff. And Jason was doing the same thing. And uh, there was a bag of Adam's jeans and shirt that he just dropped by the back door. And I didn't pick it up. I just was passive resistant. I may be passive aggressively going, hmm, I wonder if Adam's ever going to pick that up. Um, and so I walked back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, watch, like stepping over this bag. Um, and then one evening I came home and there was Bunsen flat at the back door. And I'm like, this is weird. Why are you sitting like that? He had in his paws maple syrup. That he had opened. <laughs> Why was it Yes, there? because it was in the bag. It, Adam must have taken the maple syrup to school or to somewhere where he was having maple syrup. And um, yeah, Bunsen was licking it like Winnie the Pooh. You know when Winnie the Pooh's face goes all in to the honey pot? Bunsen was all in to the maple syrup. And I he was very sad when I took it away. He was like, what? He was, was he licking so quiet. quietly or was he licking like his normal, like super loud lick with abandon, like, <laughs> like just no, like licking like no. crazy dog. He, 
he was being very, very quiet. He did not <laughs> so want to sound out. So he knew he shouldn't out. have it. No, he knew he shouldn't have because you probably were in the living room or somewhere and he's hiding out by the back door, just chowing down on this maple syrup. And then <laughs> I told Adam, like, I said, what my luck, why is this on the floor? Yeah. Where did very, this come very from? Quiet. <laughs> Let's just move, move these jeans out of the way and this shirt out of the way and uh, just lick it all on up. Well, that's different than so, Beaker. Beaker would eat through everything. She would just eat through the pants to get to the maple. Yeah, syrup. I think I think my po- my pockets are done. Sadly, on yeah, my yeah. Welcome coat. to my life, puppy Beaker ate all my pockets out. Yeah, but now she's adult Beaker, and she was shredding my pocket. <laughs> so it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's like she, although she is a, she's precision. She does have precision. Like she took Ginger's little toy and got the squeaker out and just has just the little squeakers out. And like, it looks like surgical precision. Like she undid the, the seam. Why can't she just do that with the, getting the treats out of the pocket? Why does she have to just like, oh yeah, shred the pocket. Got to get those treats. I don't know. But that's my story. Plus, more story. I gave two stories this week. You gave like three and a half stories. Hey, Dad, what kind of bagel can fly? What kind of bagel can fly? What? A plain bagel. <laughs> I don't know what. <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's story time. Oh Thank you so much the for worst. listening, and I can't wait to see you guys on the next podcast episode. Bye-bye. That's the end of another Science Podcast episode. Thanks for coming back week after week to listen to our show. Special thanks to our expert guest, Jennifer Hartman, who talked to us about her the rogue detection dogs. So wholesome, so interesting. And I'd like to give a special shout out to our top tier patrons on Patreon. Our Patreon page is growing. Thank you so much for your support. It is it is just amazing to see this community come around wholesome science communication. So thank you. Take it away, Chris. And Schlarm, Sharon Dotson, Peggy McKeel, Chris Kelly, Samantha Dodd. Debbie Anderson, Courtney Proven, Renee Hardy, Mary Ryder, Shelby Leggett, Mary Coos, Marianne McNally, Karen Beth St. George, Bianca Hyde, Julie Smith, Andrew Lynn, Elizabeth Parmenter, Sandy Brimer, Tracy Halberg, Jenny Giger, Leela Periello, Lisa Swartz, Catherine Jordan, Donna Craig, Jody Ogren, Liz Button, Kathy Zerker, and Ben Rather. For science, empathy, and cuteness.